some really, really important things of how something like this can work well and be well embedded is that we are asking the people in the system that are working, the professionals in the system, to actually bring certain things to this work. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a couple of things. The first is that, that we're asking people to understand their own power and how that affects other people. Mm -hmm. We're asking people to really listen mm -hmm. to families and to the system advisors and come into the room with an openness about what people say. So I think understanding and being able to open up and see from a different set of voices and ways of being and being able to really understand how your understanding of power is mm -hmm. in a room mm -hmm. is what is needed to truly make something like this work across a system of this kind. Welcome to the Emerging Minds podcast. Welcome everyone. My name is Beck Edser and I'm a Child and Family Partnerships Coordinator with Emerging Minds. This is the second episode of a two-part podcast where we are joining a conversation between three people, Dana Shen, Mel Lambert and Yasmin Sinclair, who have been integral to the establishment of a lived experience network within the South Australian Government's Department of Human Services Early Intervention Research Directorate. If you haven't already, I'd encourage you to listen to part one of this podcast, where we started to hear from Dana, Mel and Yasmin about what it took to create a lived experience network that facilitates families' voices, genuinely informing systems and some of their key learnings from undertaking a co-design project of this nature. In this episode, you will hear from Dana, Mel and Yasmin about how the Lived Experience Network were able to embed the group's existence and functions within the system that they had been invited to inform, as well as hearing some of the ways that really ensured that lived experience voices would be elevated. Let's continue now, first hearing from Mel and Dana about the development of the terms of reference and how they were able to ensure the longevity and sustainability of the Lived Experience Network. One of the things that comes to my mind which to my memory was one of the trickiest parts to navigate, was actually towards the end of the co-design mm. process with the, for the Lived Experience Network, was the terms of reference mm. and really working out not just what the role was, but where the edges of the role mm. were and when mm. someone moved on from the role, mm. how long was a term, who could be a member, mm. who couldn't, how would recruitment happen? Mm. Was that just DHS interviewing? So you and someone in DHS or were they involved and who? And um, we drew on previous experience and I think um, co-design doesn't mean which I think is a common misconception. Co-design doesn't mean you've got to create something innovative and new that's never been done before. There's a lot of borrowing and stealing mm -hmm. from great practice elsewhere. Yeah. And there are lots of lived experience networks mm -hmm. um, in the mental health um, space but and around the world. So we, I remember us sitting with mm -hmm. all these different versions of terms of reference mm -hmm. from lots of different networks around the world and they just sifted through and they worked out you know, a bit of a patchwork of what they felt was mm -hmm. right. But then negotiating that with DHS mm. as well, who mm. had obviously their perspective. Mm. Um, and it just goes to, I think, some of that policy and procedure stuff that at the start when it's all fun and exciting and we're creating, it's easy to forget that you need the systems in place if something goes wrong mm. or you need the systems in place to keep regenerating mm. and to keep the voice of lived experience relevant and refreshed. Because mm. that's not exciting, but mm. it's so important um, that people would know what the boundaries were and that new people could have a voice, which I know everybody wanted. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to that point where you might have to leave something mm -hmm. you love, then that's really hard. So I thought the group did such an amazing job mm -hmm. of being able to step back again and take that broader perspective on mm -hmm. we're building something here that needs to last. And we talked about mm -hmm. that. What if DHS changed their mind? You know, what if mm -hmm. Yasmin moves on? And so then it was like real incentive to mm -hmm. let's get this bedded in. Let's get the mm -hmm. rules of this down mm -hmm. so that DHS can't do that. So another really important stream when we were looking at the child and family support system, very central to that was actually how do we give voice, power, influence to Aboriginal people and all Aboriginal people, uh, whether they're families, whether they're professional stakeholders and communities. And so that was actually a key piece of that work. And there are a couple of things that came out of that. The first was that we developed a set of co-design principles 
that were taken from and, and developed from the words of Aboriginal people and allies that were in the room. And those have been applied in many different ways now across the system. So I think that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. We also had a series of what, what was called service design criteria. And again, this criteria was really about how do you ensure that there is a Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lens in the design of things across the board. And then of course, what we had also is a very strong focus on ensuring that we spoke to Aboriginal families at the same time as well, mm -hmm. to ask them how they felt and what was needed about changing the system as well. So all of those things were woven throughout the whole of the way we worked and, and had its own very special place in it. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that's had quite a profound impact in a lot of ways mm -hmm. um, when you're actually having to do things like, you know, ask people to consider that in their services. Mm -hmm. It's actually influenced and been used to influence the way people operate and work in the system. So mm -hmm. I think that's really powerful. And that included the voices of Aboriginal families too. Mm -hmm. Mel had reflected here that this was about really amplifying the voices of lived experience and particularly Aboriginal voices, which Dana has also really supported in her work collaborating with Emerging Minds. Dana continued to share with us what it is that's really important for us to do and be consciously reflecting on to keep amplifying that voice of lived experience in our work. So I think the first thing is that if we say that there's a fundamental assumption that most systems are not constructed in particular ways. They're actually constructed often for certain people in positions of hierarchical power to have influence. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's sort of fundamentally how things are set up. They're not structured for community members, family to actually have a real sense of power. So because of that, you have to make sure that you reconstruct it mm -hmm. in order for that mm -hmm. to happen. So one example that we used during the child and family support system work was that we actually created an environment where we were in a workshop, we had predominantly professionals there, but we gave an empowered and I guess kind of like a, a senior role mm. to the system advisors that it attended. And as you mentioned earlier, Mel, they had, they had tools to use if they needed them. I don't think they really used them at all. And what they did was that, and this was, it was actually wonderful to watch, is that you had professionals working on multiple tables and they would actually rotate around different tables and give their perspectives on things. And that influenced not only how people spoke, but it influenced the direction of the ideas mm -hmm. on there as well. So they actually like profoundly influenced that room because they were given the role, the right, the power in that room to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's one of the key things that's really needed to elevate lived experience in a system. Mm -hmm. so. um, I think often projects and co-design and systems recognise the need for the voice of lived experience, mm -hmm. but it's in a separate space and never overlaps and never intersects. Mm -hmm. Um, and that can be for a whole bunch of reasons. And as we said, it took time to build the trust mm -hmm. to enable that to happen. It took time to build the sense of power for those family members, those system advisors. But doing that is so important to actually create the change because we did see professionals speak differently. We did see decisions made. And as you said, design was done differently. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been one of the great things watching the Lived Experience mm -hmm. Network develop is seeing their role at the table mm. with decision makers and with professionals, that they become decision makers, mm. co-decision makers mm. with the professionals. This was a good example of the intentional ways that lived experience voices can be amplified and empowered through deconstructing the existing systems that wouldn't have necessarily allowed for them to be heard. And there's no doubt that practices like this have been integral to this group's success. I was interested to also hear about some of the really important practical considerations that have enabled this lived experience network to be effective. And the other thing that crossed my mind was payment, that we actually acknowledge people's time and contribution and reimburse them for that. And so that's something that Dana and I both hold dear and will only really do co-design work if there's that commitment from a client to acknowledge and pay people for their time mm. because as professionals we're all paid to mm. be there um, and it seems again like a massive power imbalance 
that people with, coming with their lived experience aren't um, acknowledged mm. and respected for that time. And things like when things run, mm. you know, that don't run something at 9am in the morning mm. and expect families to be there because they're taking their kids to school. Don't run something at 5pm at night and expect someone living in aged care to go mm. because, you know, there's lots happens in the evenings with mm. dinners and transport. And so it's about knowing the demographic mm. that you're working with and designing things around them. I think, yeah, the commitment from DHS to pay the system advisors a reimbursement for their time is significant because it really does add up, especially when you've got 15 people in the network. Um, so I think that's incredibly important, as well as the resource of having my position mm -hmm. allocated to do the work. Um, it wouldn't happen in the same way if there wasn't mm. that, you know, coordination, but also the support. Um, so the system advisors will sometimes reach out to me, sometimes about the work, but also about stuff going on in their own lives. Mm. And so often I'm a connector person to serve the service sector mm. for them to try and connect them in with the right, right services. We sort of structure the group so that we meet fortnightly and we have different um, presenters come and present to the group or consult with them about a particular policy area so the group know ahead of time what mm. topics are scheduled and, and what what our plan is. And I think that's done in, a, in a, it was really positive because we've often got, you know, 10 or so system advisors and families in the room and then one or two professionals coming mm. to speak to them. So the balance of power is different mm -hmm. to what it's like in the service sector normally. So that's been great that they have developed the confidence and the safety to be able to provide feedback in that environment. But I think the other thing that DHS is wanting to explore more is amplifying their voices in other settings. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to do a communities of practice. Um, that is a new thing that we're going to start where um, we have some forums for executive leaders and then some forums for practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, and the Lived Experience Network were involved in one recently and we you know, asked them if they wanted to speak about um, the Adult Supporting Kids website that they'd been involved in designing so five of them put their hand up and we designed the questions with them and um, it was a facilitated discussion mm -hmm. but up on the stage mm -hmm. and you know I think that that was really successful the the families were really happy to have a say and mm -hmm. to be heard by all these executive leaders in the room and you know so I think that was a really powerful exchange of, of mm -hmm. information and I'm hopeful that that will continue and just grow over mm -hmm. time that their voices mm -hmm. can be heard in that setting and as you said you know with practitioners and actually having the service sector think about families mm -hmm. and think about their language and and have them have that influence in the design of the work that they're doing. Mm. And you remind me when you say that, Yasmin, that I think some really, really important things of how something like this can work well and be well embedded is that we are asking the people in the system that are working, the professionals in the system, to actually bring certain things to this work. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a couple of things. The first is that, that we're asking people to understand their own power mm -hmm. and how that affects other people. Mm -hmm. Um, we're asking people to really listen to families and to the system advisors and come into the room with an openness about what people say. So I think understanding and being able to open up and see from a different set of voices and ways of being and being able to really understand how your understanding of power is mm -hmm. in a room mm -hmm. is what is needed to truly make something like this work across a system of this kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I asked Dana and Mel first, what tips would they give to an organisation wanting to set up lived experience systems and what things will ensure the sustainability and effectiveness of this? Think really carefully about what you can and can't do. Like what resourcing do you have? What are the constraints you're operating within? And really challenging yourself about where you are and aren't willing or able to share power. Because I'm sure Dan has had these conversations too where an agency will ask to do co-design. But when you start examining some of those factors, it's consultation. It's not genuine co-design. So I think if we're talking about lived experience, this is about the voice of lived experience being around the table, fundamentally doing co-design with an agency. It's not just a tick the box. It's not just a nice to have. Um, and for in order for that to 
work, I think you have to have that foundational conversation internally mm -hmm. about what you can and can't and what you are and aren't able or willing to do. And then because if it can't be done in a way where they have a genuine role that influences, then don't do it. Mm -hmm. Another thing I would say is that it was really important, I think, it, well, I think it made a difference that Mel and I had actually met a number of families. Mm -hmm. So we built a trust and relationship mm -hmm. in a process where families felt that they had an influence. Mm -hmm. So when you can build that and they can experience what that's like, the ability for us to connect them into the next step mm -hmm. was much easier. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important that whatever you're doing, that you have people involved in it that really believe in families, believe in people, can build really trusting relationships with people mm -hmm. uh, where you are seen as someone that they can trust mm -hmm. and that you have their respect. You, you do need that because mm -hmm. it takes a lot of time to build relationships with people mm -hmm. where they genuinely go, actually, this could be real. Mm -hmm. Actually, maybe I might be able to really do something different here. Mm -hmm. well, and again, that was something DHS did really well because having contracted us to work with them on co-designing the system and building those relationships, they asked us to then come in and work alongside Yasmin mm -hmm. and really play a mentor role mm -hmm. to Yasmin in co-developing the mm -hmm. co-design of the system, of the lived experience network. Mm -hmm. And we did that warm handover mm -hmm. to Yasmin. Mm -hmm. um, it was quite a while before we withdrew and we're more in that background mentoring role because those relationships were so mm -hmm. important. You do need to tailor it to your context mm. and your need and your population group and your the outcomes you're seeking to mm. have to, to create, but draw on what's out there mm. and learn from what's happening locally, but also mm. internationally. And yeah, really thinking about all of those structural things about how is this gonna last? Mm -hmm. Now, how do we you know, kickstart this with the group we have now, but then a staff member leaves or families move on or mm -hmm. the lived experience advisors move on and it can lose momentum? Mm -hmm. How, you know, really designing for the future mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, it feels boring at the time, mm -hmm. but that structural stuff mm -hmm. is so important to make sure it's got long-term mm -hmm. life. For Yasmin, supporting the running of the Lived Experience Network, she offered advice for others who might be in a role similar to hers about the key elements that have been integral to the effectiveness of this group. Yeah, I think definitely the considering of resources is mm. number one. I guess the first thing that you really mm. need is that mm. commitment from the mm. organisation mm -hmm. um, and the leadership. So that comes along with resources. But yeah, I think my role has very much been about supporting the group and listening to the group and helping them shape what we're doing. Mm. And I think sometimes services might think, we don't really have enough work for families to do to have an ongoing group but I think what I've realized is that there is so many opportunities you know for them to have a voice and to contribute and um, you know I've got a list of people waiting to mm -hmm. meet with the group and projects that we need to contribute to so be creative and once you start sort of scratching the surface you can see there are all these opportunities mm -hmm. uh, the families particularly in our lived experience network have a real passion for language and the words and the way we communicate our services to the public so we've spent a lot of time look talking about language and contributing to the policy work and the language that is actually in some of our documentation so for example we have practice guides for practitioners and you know we did these brainstorming consultations with the group about safe home visiting and risk and safety planning and how do practitioners do these tasks with families in a way that's respectful and safe and so we brainstormed all of that and then the DHS staff went back to their practice guides and inputted a whole lot of mm -hmm. their words and language into their documentation. Um, and then what was great that we were able to do was show those documents to the mm -hmm. lived experience group and, and we had it all highlighted in red, all their words and mm -hmm. their um, contribution. And mm -hmm. there was so much throughout mm -hmm. all of the documents. They were just blown away mm -hmm. that that was their words mm -hmm. and these documents were going to go to practitioners to help guide and inform their practice. And that mm -hmm. just brings me to a point that probably seems so obvious, I haven't thought to say it yet, mm -hmm. but yes, lived experience work requires resource and funding and time but actually in the bigger picture it saves money and mm. resource and time mm. because what you've just described is improving practice yeah. so that you know families or, or staff are 
equipped and trained mm. to build better connections with families, which mm. leads to better engagement, which leads to better outcomes for mm -hmm. families. Yeah. And I think that's true across the board because the lived experience network at each turn are testing concepts. Mm. So the Adults Supporting Kids website is mm. a great example mm. where you know, you've done such great work with the group mm. to really test elements of that website before it goes live, mm. which means that that website is much more likely to reach the families it mm. needs to reach mm -hmm. and for it to resonate with them. Mm -hmm. So I think it can be seen as this upfront cost and, and sometimes systems can go down the path of we don't have enough time, we don't have enough money, mm. but then money gets spent on designing services that mm. don't work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and whether, whether people do this formally or informally, I really do believe that it's important for everybody working in a system to really analyse their own understanding of what power means. Mm -hmm. I really think more people should be studying it mm -hmm. in their personal lives and in professional lives, really understanding what it means to truly give space for somebody else that can often be considered or named vulnerable, mm -hmm. can often be the people that we have to help you know, that's often the, the language that mm. can get used. Mm. And actually what we're trying to say is that, and as you've said, Mel, in many ways, you, you're understanding that, but you're turning a lot of it upside down mm. as well. Mm. And you're actually saying, hang on a second, the vulnerable, the people we help, mm. are going to be able to help. Mm -hmm. They're going to be able to help us mm. um, to get this right for other people. Yeah. Not everybody or every system is ready for that. Mm. So for me, I think study yourself and mm. study what it means to really experience what it feels like to have to give over some mm -hmm. of those things mm -hmm. um, for people to really have power in a system. I think it would be worthwhile formal or informal learning that people mm -hmm. do if you really want to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There have been many factors that have contributed to the success of this lived experience network, including the system advisor's commitment and generosity the authorising environment and resourcing that the Department of Human Services has been able to offer, as well as Dana, Mel and Yasmin's considered planning and support throughout the co-design process. We thank them for sharing this journey with us. And remember, if you're interested in learning more about working with lived experience family partners, you can check out Emerging Minds Child and Family Partnerships Toolkit. Thank you for joining me today. Visit our website at www.emergingminds.com.au to access a range of resources to assist your practice. Brought to you by the National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health, led by Emerging Minds. The National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health under the National Support for Child and Youth Mental Health Programme.